I think uh, somebody's been reading my mail because uh, Anna came to me a, a week and a half ago and said, uh, you're preaching in Orford today. I said, okay, that's great. Do we have a subject? And she said, yes, we do. And she looked at me and said, peace. I went, oh. <laughs> the reason is, um, God's got a great sense of humour. The reason is, um, we're actually going through a transition. Uh, as a family, what I'm doing, how I'm operating, and to be honest with you, I probably had three months when I wasn't really at peace, when I was trying to work things out in my own strength. Does anybody else like that? Are we yeah. the yeah. yeah. That we think we know the answers, and we think we know what to do, and we do it, and we're pleased we've done it, and then a week later, when we look back, or perhaps a month later, we look back and go, oh, that wasn't a good idea, was it? <laughs> and uh, I've been going through this for a long time, and then when I came and said, you're preaching on priests, priests, sorry, I thought, hmm, uh, I need to get my life right, first of all, because I hadn't got that peace that I should have had. So, Today we're looking at peace and uh, we need to live in peace. Who knows that at this time of the year we're always, or the media is going on about peace and goodwill. But everybody's chasing something that they can't find. If you switch on the news and see what's happening in Syria, in Iraq, in Chile, in Argentina, Venezuela, there's no peace. In fact, you haven't got to go that far. Even in our own country there's strife. Shall we leave? Shall we stay? Shall we move? Shall we go? If we go, how do we go? There's nothing that we can honestly say gives us peace. Everything is, if you like, up in the air. Nobody knows exactly what's happening. And there's this spirit of fear all over the world now. And it's, it's everywhere, wherever you go. Yeah. I was talking to some people in France the other day, and sometimes you say, well, their teams have got it together. No, they haven't. They've got a mess. They're striking on the streets and, and the trains, etc. What am I trying? I'm trying to portray the picture as it is in the world. Yeah. And the world is not at peace. But the problem is, if the world comes in the church and we're not in peace, there's a problem. Yeah. Who knows that a ship on the sea is great? But seeing the ship is probably not so good. And so we've got to be very careful as Christians that we don't allow the world's system and the world's worries and stresses, etc., to come upon us. I know, and I'm being very honest, that I allowed some of the world's ways to come into me. That I started to sit down and make plans and think, how do we do this? What do we do here? How do I plan? And I wasn't leaving it to God. And then Anna would say to me, we haven't left it with God. We've left it with God and you've picked it up again. And what's the point of that? I must have kept it. You know, if we're going to give something to God, we need to give it to God, forget about it, walk away, and know that God's got it all sorted. Hallelujah. It may not look like it, but I'm here to tell you, if you're going through some stuff, God is working on your situation. Because I now, when I look back six months ago, what I was stressed about or worried about, I realised that He had everything in control. All I had to do was rely on him and a little bit less on me. What does God say? What does God say? Peace I leave with you. This is from John 14, verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Not as the world gives to you. Do you know the world's idea of peace? is when there's no trouble. Now, church, <laughs> let's make it clear. Jesus said, you know, you will have tribulation. He actually declared it. So, if you've come today believing that because you're a Christian, you're not going to get in trouble or tribulation, you got it wrong. But what we do know is that Jesus has overcome every, every situation, every stress, whatever it is, Jesus is overcoming. Hallelujah. And that excites me. That excites me because I know when I'm going through some stuff, I know that I can rely on Jesus. And you know, me bringing this word this morning has really quickened me to the fact that I was too much relying on my own strength. Too much relying on my own decisions. 
and not enough spending time with Jesus and letting him sort my problems out. Peace with others. You know, uh, we were at a church last Sunday, uh, I won't say where it is, in the Indian area. And my heart went out for this particular woman. She's recently become a Christian, and none of her family are Christians, apart from one of, the, one of the children. And she was having problems about coming to church. Her, her, her husband didn't like it, her family didn't like it, but she, she knew she had to come. And she was sitting there, and she, as I was bringing the word, she was crying. And I realised that it wasn't because of what I was saying. It was because of what God was doing in her at the time. Yes. And after I went up and said to her, I said, well, tell me, what, what was going on in your life? I can, I can see that you're troubled as well. And she said, I made a commitment to Jesus. But when I made the commitment to Jesus, my husband said, he's leaving me. My husband said, I don't want some religious nut in the house. I don't want some religious nut telling my children how to live. And the parents of the, her parents-in-law were obviously the, the dominant party in the, and they were leading the way. It's a bit like the, um, the Jezebel spirit. And this, this uh, woman, the mother, uh, sorry, the, uh, the grandmother, she was the one with the Jezebel spirit. And she was in a situation, she didn't know what to do. She wanted to go to church, she, she committed her life to Jesus, but she also wanted her family. And we talked and we talked, and what came out was that she had some unforgiveness in her life. And this unforgiveness goes back probably 20 years, when she was going to school with her sister. And since the age of 16, she hadn't talked talked with her sister. And I took her to the scripture and I said to her, listen, Jesus has forgiven you of everything, but you need to forgive others. Well, I can't. I said, you need to. And I took her to the scripture where Jesus tells us that we've got to forgive. And when, when Peter says, how many times have I forgiven? Seven times seven, or seventy-seven, or hundred seventy-seven, or two thousand and seventy-seven. We just have to keep giving. Forgiving, sorry. Anyway, she did. She forgave, she forgave her sister, and I said, if you can bring her, it'd be a great idea to ring her, if you can't, or write to her, but it'd be good to contact her and say you forgive her. Anyway, we heard back, beginning of the week, that she'd gone round to every single person <coughs> asking for forgiveness. And do you know what happened? On the day after she'd done the last forgiveness, her husband came to her and said, I don't like the idea of you going to church, but you can go and you can take the children. But don't expect them to go. You see how God works behind the scenes. But we need to have peace. We need to have peace with others. We have to have peace. Peace. Not striving to work out ourselves what we're going to do. You know, the first thing is peace with God. You know, how often we beat ourselves up because we do something stupid and we think God doesn't love us anymore or God doesn't care for us anymore. That's not the truth. I want to take you back to before you were a Christian. Did you sometimes do good things? Yes, you did. You helped perhaps your next door neighbour or <coughs> me in my, my situation. I used to go to my father and, and take me to the hospital and things like that. I did good things, but I'm still a sinner. If you can imagine over here, we've got a cage. And this cage is a cage of sin. When you're born, you're born into sin. It's automatic because of what Adam did. You are born into sin, but you do do good things. When you come to know Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, you move over to here. And this is a cage of righteousness. Do you do bad things? Yes, you do. You do do things that you regret doing. But does that make you unrighteous? No. Because the blood of Jesus has taken you from the cage of sin to the cage of righteousness. Whatever you do, just as when you were a sinner, you did good things, it didn't make you righteous. 
just as when you become righteous. Through the blood of Jesus, even when we miss the mark, when we sin, God still loves us and we're still righteous. And we can still come boldly before the throne of God. We can still declare in the midst of what's going on that we are the righteousness of God because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Peace with the circumstances. I mean, I work with uh, inner in school and we've got a lot of young people. <clears throat> and it's amazing to see how they are, how they react. And they literally, they're, they're like thermostats. If it's good, they're up here. Well, I'm great, yes, everything's going well, I've, I've got a pay rise, whatever. And then the next day, they're down in the dumps. I say, what's wrong? Oh, I've just got a big tax bill, I've got to pay. They're, they're up and down. Now, I expect this from the world, but we don't want it to come into the church. We're not thermometer Christians. We're thermostat Christians because we set the temperature. We set the circumstances around us. We, with Jesus living inside of us, the hope of glory, we decide with him how we're going to attack that problem or situation. You must have peace with the circumstances. You know, the world, as I said, you would think if there's no trouble, it's fine. Everything's fine. But it doesn't work that way. Because the world has problems as well. But we need to know that whatever's going on, and I don't know who this is for this morning, but I'm here to tell you, whatever you're facing, whatever's going on, whatever that circumstance is, Jesus has the answer. And Jesus is saying, quite simply, give it to me. Let me take it. Give it to me. You know, we've got to have faith to do this. It reminds me of the story of the, uh, the woman with the issue of blood. <coughs> When she goes down, she touches the sleep, the prayer shawl of Jesus. And he stops and says, whoa, who touched me? Who pushed me? I mean, the disciples must have thought, hey, well, there's, there's a crowd here. I don't know if it's a thousand or two thousand or a hundred. We don't know. But what we do know, they're all pushing along. But he said, no, somebody <coughs> touched me. And what he meant was virtue went out of him. Righteousness went out of him. He knew there was a transfer from him to them because of faith. And I'm here to encourage you, if you want to see peace, then you've got to have faith to believe that whatever you've left in Jesus' hands, he will deal with. Just like the woman with the issue of blood, she knew full well if she could just touch the hem of his garment, she would be healed. She would be set free. You know, she tried everything that she could, but nothing would, 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 would sort out the problem. But just one touch from Jesus, just one encounter with Jesus turned her life completely around. If we need peace, and we want peace, we have to have that same encounter with Jesus. We have to be prepared to leave everything aside and say, push it. Even if you don't feel like it, do it afraid, but whatever it is, just do it. But know that as you push into Jesus, as you have that faith to believe, then things start to move. Things start to change. And they change for good. And peace with yourself, as you said, that's so important. We must have peace with ourselves. Whatever's going on, give it to Jesus. You know, as I said to you, there's so much going on both. I've talked about it about the work of me sort of uh, stepping back. I'm not going to use the word retiring. I hate it because it says of no retiring in the Oxford Dictionary actually means of no further. Well, I'm not a retirement age yet. I may look it, but I'm not. But uh, what I'm doing, I'll explain to you what I'm doing. What I'm doing is putting in position people who love Jesus, who run the company forward. Because I don't want to retire at the age of 65 or 66 or 67 and the company doing this. I want it to continue because it's carrying a banner, the banner of Jesus Christ. You know, we're planting churches in Holland, uh, uh, Christian schools in Holland, we're starting some in England soon. And the, I, I don't want all the work that Jesus has done through me going to nothing. So I planned it. And it's very hard for me, I've got to be honest. I, I put somebody above me because I believe in them. And my partner is born again, you know, what he believes in too. So he's above me. 
So I'm, I've done this for 40 years, and suddenly I'm, I'm up with, with my cage and the earth, and they say, Pete, you're not needed. And I think, ooh, well, I'll sit down again. And it's a feeling of unease, with a feeling of, of not of peace, because things are changing. They're making decisions, and I'm walking in and they say, oh, we're doing this and that. And I said, oh, maybe talk to me, well, we don't need to do it. And I went, no, you don't. Quite right. And God is teaching me to have peace in this transition. The other change is obviously our role, but our family role, Anna, Lucy, and myself. Many of you know, some of us see some new faces who don't know, but we've been coming to this church for over 20 years. We originally uh, came with uh, Generations Church, and they planted it, which they then called the Arts Christian Fellowship. And I stayed because God told me to stay. I remember one day, and again I'm being, I'm being very open and very honest with you, I remember one day we were in the old building before it was done up, and, and Lee Goodwin was preaching something you know. And I looked, I, I was looking around and I said, Lord, I want to go back to now. I, I don't want to be here. And God said to me, okay, if you go back to now, I'll still bless you. But if you stay where I've called you, which is here, I'll doubly bless you. Well, there's no discussion. You couldn't get me out of the building. That was it. I was staying in all. But the last sort of year, year and a half, God has taken us further afield. There's some stuff going on. I mean, I don't understand. Can I tell you? I don't understand. I'm not being big headed because it's Jesus. But the other week, I'm driving to a meeting in Manchester. I won't say which one, but meeting the CEO of a large Christian or the largest Christian broadcasting company in the world. And I was in the car, I already asked this question to Anna, I'd asked it to God, and I was on the N62 going over, and I said, God, what am I doing? I don't know why I'm going to the meeting, I don't know what it's about, I don't know what they expect, do they know that I'm, I'm, I'm no longer part of my company, and no longer put my hands in the tin, etc. Is it money they're after, because I haven't got that much? Anyway, as I was going over, God said, shh, shh, I'm planning. I'm building. You're not ready yet. And then the words came to me that you're not where you used to be. But you're not where I'm taking you. So you're not going to feel settled or whatever because God, we're all on a journey. Mm. And sometimes we, we, we feel uneasy about the journey. We're not at peace because we don't understand. The truth is, we're not where we used to be. But we're not where God's taking us. We're on a journey. And I don't think God wants us to be sad when we're on a journey. Anyway, I went to the meeting and things were discussed and, uh, yeah, there's a lot to do. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, if this, this is what I'm meant to do, Lord, I'll do it. I'll fit it in. I'll, I'll make... But what, what am I saying? To us, we know we're on a journey, but nothing is clear. But one thing God did say to us, three or four years ago, when he, when he started to talk to us as a family, about doing something different. He said, I want you to go out and I want you to network churches together. And I'm going to share this with you because the, the thing is, when you don't see the picture, it's like a puzzle. And when you don't see the, the full picture, you start worrying. Well, I did. I want to share it with you. I was worried because God was taking some places that we didn't understand, we didn't know where we were going. One, one Saturday, about... Four years ago, perhaps five years ago, me and Anna were in prayer. And God says, go across the hub. So, go to Revive, church. So, we said, we wanted to go to all. No, go to Revive. So, we both got it independently, all at the same time. So, Anna, being, she's really techy, she goes on to uh, Revive Hub and, uh, what was Jared Cooper and that? So, okay, we'll go, we'll go and hear Jared Cooper. He's a good speaker, we've heard him on the TV too. So over we go. And we get there, we're in the middle of the cinema, it's in the, the, the used to meet in the cinema. And we're sitting down, and I'm saying to him, I wonder what Jared's going to preach about today. And he didn't preach. In fact, he wasn't even in hell. He was, he was in Nice. Anyway, um, this little lad, a man, stood up and started to preach, and I said to him, do you know him? And I said, no, I don't. No, do I? Oh, I hope it's good. Anyway, we took all this way, you know, and a half to hear somebody we don't know. Anyway, so bad. So bad. Anyway, the guy talking was Andrew Murray. And afterwards, Lucy got to uh, uh, 
uh, uh, children's area where I sit, I sit to and I write. They've got nice coffee here, it was Costa. I said, I'll go to the, to the Costa coffee and I'll wait for you there. Well, I'm sitting down at my coffee, not talking to anybody, because I decided I was going to have a really quiet, peaceful Sunday. And this guy came, Andrew came up to me and said, Are you alright? I said, Yeah. He said, I haven't seen you before. I said, No, it's the first time. And then he said, uh, He started to talk to me about what he did. I said, um, Is anything special in your mind? Because he, he, he sort of sat there and didn't say a lot. And he said, No, he just said, God, can't, God told me to come and have a chat with you. So I can. Anyway, the rest is history, as you know. Um, God is working with us in your mind. But this is the point I want to get to. I didn't see that at that first meeting. And I didn't see it until we saw, perhaps, what God's doing. And it's not to say how good we are, just saying that when we started this journey, we didn't know really what we were doing. We were being moved out of our comfort zone because we love Orford. We love coming to Orford. We know that when we come here, we're with friends. We know that it doesn't matter if we only come once a month. We know we're with friends. And we know that the Spirit of God is moving and it's so exciting to see it. You know, God is sorting everything out and there's <coughs> unity here. But I'm coming back that Anna does Facebook. I don't, I didn't know Anna to get Facebook on, on the phone, but she does. Anyway, on this Facebook was your uh, flyer for Andrew Murray. And it said, Orford Storehouse, and even with Andrew Murray, music by Generations Church and that. And I said to Anna, I said, do you realise yeah. we are doing exactly what God wants us to do? Yeah. It's not about us, but I wonder if Andrew would have been here, if generations would have been here, and the whole thing would have happened if we hadn't done our part that Jesus asked us to do. It's not about us. Please yeah. get that clear. It's not about me or Anna. It's about doing what God wants us to do. Yeah. And I suddenly yeah. thought, this is exciting. We've got, for the first time ever, we've got about five churches in Grimsby, in Indian, working together. We've got one going out from Grimsby, helping the other. There's been a one bit more church with a problem in, in Grimsby, uh, with a church. And, and Joe and Matt have gone from generations to help that church out. This is exciting. When church starts working together, it's exciting. When church all pulls together as one body, it becomes exciting. That's when we see the miracles. That's when we see the breakthroughs. That's when we see the supernatural move. When we don't see it as all for the storehouse or generations or whatever, we see it as the body of Christ moving forward to take back what the enemy has stolen. And by doing that, we have peace. Hallelujah. So, let's, if we looked at the different areas of peace, Let's just for a minute look at how we get peace. Peace comes through communion with Jesus Christ. As we did, we took communion together. We as a family take it every day. I suggest you take it every day. Do you know, there's, uh, Joseph Prince tells the story of this, I um, may not have all the facts right, but certainly, uh, certainly the baseline. He talks about this little Indian boy. He must have been 11 or 12 when he had a stroke. And the whole of his right side of his face completely dropped. He couldn't see properly, he couldn't hear properly, he could hardly talk, and he could hardly eat. Well, this, this couple, this Indian couple, weren't uh, poor. They had money, and they took their child to every doctor they could. Every doctor they could. And they couldn't do anything for him. And then they went to Joseph Prince's church. And they got on this book about communion and the power of communion. And they decided as a family, we're going to take communion every day. And they took communion every day and nothing changed. But they said, no, we believe Jesus. We believe in the power of Jesus. And they kept taking it, and they kept taking it, and they kept taking it. And slowly but surely, his face improved. This, the droop went up. His eyesight came back, his hearing came back. In fact, after about three months of continually taking communion, he was healed. And they went back to the original doctor. And the doctor said, well, because the stroke is had, and because of the, the brain development of the child, he will be, to a certain point, brain, there will be some part of his brain that won't work normally. 
But to help the brain uh, and to help the child to, to be able to cope with it, we're going to send you for an MRI scan or, or whatever scan it was. Anyway, they went to the scan. They came back and the brain was perfect. It was just as if he'd never had that stroke in the first place. You know, this power of communion, I'm going to, I'm going to suggest that as a body, at home, we take it every day. Find a quiet time that suits the family and take communion together. And take it and know that Jesus is on your case. That healing comes through Jesus Christ. Peace comes through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Another piece of scripture I'd like to bring to you, uh, just before I, I'm going to share with you another thing. It says, For the mountains may depart, and the hills may be removed. That's pretty awesome. But my steadfast love shall not depart from you, and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. Let's say, for example, you're suffering with sickness this morning. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I just want to share with you about communion with Jesus. I'm going to take you back about eight years. And I was quite ill. And uh, I'd gone through all these tests. And I'd gone hospitals in Lincoln and Grantham and wherever. Anyway, I landed up in Grimsby. And they, you know what it's like when you get on a, on a carousel? It's like a carousel. You have one, one uh, uh, interview, what do you want to call it? One surgeon looks at you. Then he passes down to another surgeon, and another surgeon. And each time it involves some scan or something very nasty happening to you. And this is going on until it finally came after about a year. I've been going through this nearly every week. It came to what they called the, the cross meeting. And they had three or four surgeons around this desk. And <clears throat> as I walked in, the computer was on, and it was a picture of my insides. Not very nice, I tell you. But anyway, that's another story. And they started to tell me what was wrong. And if I didn't do it, what would happen to me? And it basically wasn't good news. I had every reason to lose my peace. Because they were basically saying that if you don't do the operation, Within six months or a year, I'd be dead. Then they started to explain what they were doing, which wasn't very nice, but I thought, well, that, well, okay, carry on. Anyway, they carried on. Then they left me with what I wouldn't be able to do, which I could do at that time. And I'm sitting there, and he's looking at me. He's looking at me very strange. He keeps saying, are you okay? I oh, yeah, I'm fine. But what I was doing was, I was muttering. Uh, Joshua talks about meditating. I was meditating on scripture and I was talking just very quietly. By his stripes I was here. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I'm not talking as quietly as I was because you didn't know what I was saying, but I was talking quietly and he stopped again and said, You're okay. I said, Yes. And I carried on and as I was praying in the spirit and as I was declaring the words of the Bible over my life, I felt a new, a new power come over me. I felt this audacious feeling that I'd just get up and go. Anyway, it was getting bigger and bigger. The more I prayed, the more I spoke out scripture, the more I got peace, and the more I got, do you know what? I'm not going to do anything the doctor's telling me to do. Anyway, the time came, he said, well, what we'll do is, the time is the best to say. If you'd like to uh, come to my nurse, and this is going to fit the catheter on you. And I took my bag that I had with me, and I stood up. And I walked towards the door. He said, no, not that door, that door. He said, no, door went to his office. He said, no, I'm going. He said, no, you can go for that door. Don't go for that door. He said, no, you don't understand. I'm going. He said, what do you mean you're going? He, I said, I'm not having it done. Now, believe me, if you want to know what peace is, try, who knows going to be in the hospital? Yeah, the long yeah. corridor. I was walking down that corridor, and my legs were becoming like jelly. And I'm thinking, what have I done? Because the surgeon said to me, if you walk out of here, we're sending your files back to your doctor, and for us, the case is closed. And I, I was out. I got And I kept walking down. And I just kept declaring scripture. And the peace was still there. And I thought, it must be right, because I've got peace. Anyway, I got to the, the doctor, what do you call it, sliding doors. 
just in the entrance of uh, Grimsby Hospital. And the Holy Spirit stopped me and says, don't go out there unless you're 100% committed to the fact that I am your healer. Don't waver. Don't waver. Have faith. Either walk back if you haven't, or walk through that door if you have. But know that I have healed you. But you have to make that step. Rather like Joshua did. And I watched the door, and this guy came over to me and said, you okay? Because I just stopped in the middle. And people were always like, rushing past me. Said, yes, I'm fine, I'm just preparing to leave. <laughs> and I went to pay. And they had, I don't know if they still got it, they had a little kiosk where the, the, the car park then uh, pays you a ticket. And I went to pay. And he said to me, oh, are you okay? I said, I've been going every week, he's like a friend. And he said, you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. He said, I'll see you next week then. I said, no, you won't. He said, oh, is that it? He said, yeah, that's it, I'm not coming back. And I walked to the car, and I sat in the car, and <laughs> man, what have I just done? But I still have peace. We have peace by communion with Jesus, by listening to what he says to us. The Holy Spirit is, our, is, a, is a lamp unto our feet. Is that okay if I give you another example of the Holy Spirit moving? This is Andrew Woman. Most of you know and heard of Andrew Woman. Um, he was due to fly on a, on a missionary uh, expedition to somewhere in Africa. And he didn't get peace. The peace had totally left him. And he says to his wife, I don't know why, I haven't got peace about taking that flight. I haven't got peace about going to Kenya at this time. I just don't have peace. So he goes, okay, let's, let's go into our quiet room and let's pray. And they pray. And it's about 24 hours before he's meant to go. And she said, no, I don't get peace on her. You're not going. So he does what he hates to do when he's made a booking because he knew that the crowds would be already booked, the, the venues were booked, the flights were booked. He rang up the pastor and said, I'm sorry, I can't come. And the pastor, to be honest, was quite annoyed because he said, do you realize how much we spent arranging for you to come? And 24 hours or 14 hours before you're due to be here, you're now phoning us to say you're not coming. He said, I'm sorry, I don't have peace. And the Holy Spirit has not given me peace. I am not coming. And he said he'd rather grieve people than grieve the Holy Spirit. And isn't that something that we can learn as well, that we need to do what the Holy Spirit, te Spirit, Holy Spirit tells us. Even if we're going to upset people. We might upset them for a little short while, but we do what God tells us to do by communion with the Holy Spirit. He tells us what to do. Well, that flight never got to Africa. It crashed on table. And if Andrew had not listened to the Holy Spirit, he would not have been here today. So I'm telling you, we need to listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying. His word is a lamp unto our path. Either this word, church, either this word <coughs> is absolute yeah. or it's obsolete. Mm -hmm. You've got to make the choice. How do you see the word of God? Are you willing to line up with the word of God? What is, what is the word of God saying in my situation? What do you say? We need to, uh, every time something crops up in my life, I turn to the Bible. I try to deal with it. I'll be honest. I try to deal with it in my own strength. And when I realise I'm making a real hash of it, that it's not going right, that I'm causing more problems and more situations than I need to, I come to Jesus and say, Lord, I'm so sorry. I am so sorry. You know, praise and prayer are so important. Praise and prayer are so important. I want to, I'll finish in a minute, uh, but I just want to read the scripture I can find it. Hallelujah. It's, you know, we've got to realise that Jesus died for us. That we might have this Zoe life. The Zoe life of knowing that whatever we're going through, we've got abundance. It's ours. It's not something that we get when we go to heaven. It's now. He died for us. That you might have life and have it to the full. And that's for now. You know, we should be excited. You know, this is, this is the time that we celebrate Jesus' birth. It's a time that we celebrate new life. You know, and I see new life in this church. I, I see new life. I see new birth. I see, I see a change. A, a 
total change. There was, if I go back over six months, I felt that there was a, a spirit of fear, of depression, of uh, laissez faire. If you like, just it'll do, it'll do. But it's gone now. That's why I'm so excited to still remain part of this. Perhaps I'm a distance, but I still remain part of it. Because I see what God's going to do in this church. I see what God's going to do through each and every one of you. You know, you are the body. You're here in Orphan. And you've been called for a time like this. I'm excited. I mean, you've come from Christian. That's exciting. I love it. God's calling in the right people at the right time. For a reason and for a purpose. You know, I don't think it would be much easier for you to go to Frisley uh, Christian Fellowship, which exists, I don't know. But you drove half an hour, 40 minutes. You know, this is what God... Why? Because you heard the call of God. You've got to be here. 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 If you're not here, you don't hear the word of God. You don't get the blessings. It's through the word of God we get the blessings, we get the empowerment. The last thing I'm going to share with you about... But Joshua, Joshua 1 says, everywhere where you put your feet, I have given you. It's not we've got to fight to get it, he's given it to us. We've got to get hold of that. We are, we are, if you like, we are fighting for, for a place of victory. We've already won the victory. You know, praise and worship is in, in uh, I said the last point. Do you remember in Jehoshaphat? He said the, he said the choir before him. I realise time's going on, you can read about it yourself, but you know, as he said the choir in front, what happened to the enemy? The enemy was beaten, the enemy was destroyed. You know, as you praise and worship Jesus, situations change, they have to change. And I'm excited that the fact is that in 2019, we can go forward looking at 2020, knowing it's the best year ever. You know, when we switch on the television or the radio or whatever, even newspaper, it all looks doom and gloom. It is. It's doom and gloom. But listen, that's, that's not important. That's not who we are. We are strangers here. This is not our home. That's our home. But we're sent here to do something. We're sent here to do a job that Jesus called us to do. And I'm so excited. I'm so excited because I realise in these end days, he's empowered each and every one of us. You know, I talk about the glory cloud that's over us. You know, don't walk away, don't walk out of it. Remain under that glory cloud. You know, the glory cloud is not for everyone. The glory cloud is for this church, this body. You know, it's exciting to know that the, the, the anointing oil is running down over each and every one of us. It's no wonder that a man who was excited this morning She's excited because she knows, she feels in the spirit, that God is about to do something great, something big. He's doing something great anyway. The, but the best is yet to come. You know, as we go into 2020, the world makes resolutions, which they all break. You know, we don't need to make them. Because Jesus made one, which is never broken. That he'll always be by our side. He'll always love us. He'll always care for us. He'll always empower us. All we need to do is to do what he calls us to do. So 2020, you might hear your friends when your neighbours say, well, it's going to be this or that. It doesn't matter. You know, plead the blood of Jesus when you get up every morning. Plead the blood of Jesus over your family, over your journeys. We always do, over everything. Whatever you're doing, plead the blood of Jesus. <coughs> Great peace <coughs> have those who love your Lord. Nothing can make them stumble. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. For just two minutes, and I'm conscious of the time, I just want us to, to think, have we peace this morning? Have you peace with Jesus this morning? Is there something in your life that is causing you stress or anxiety? Now is the time. Jesus is here this morning. Now is the time to simply say, Jesus, I give it to you. Now is the time to say, God, I don't want to deal with it anymore. I leave it to you. Because, you know, he's the Prince of Peace. We don't need to go around stressful. We don't need to go around worrying. We don't need 
to worry that tomorrow we've got to pay a bill that we haven't got the money for. He's our great provider. Jesus is our provider. Jesus is the way. Hallelujah. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Peace only comes through Jesus Christ. There's no other way we can have peace in this time without Jesus Christ. Can we just quietly bow our heads, please? And I want you to...